Ever since I started playing football, I've been fascinated with the whole idea of how to take the perfect free kick. And now, here's an opportunity. Big stadium, manicured lawn, quality opposition, it's a lock. But before I try emulating Zico, Beckham or Roberto Carlos, there's some really interesting science to consider. First, let's look at a bit of history. When football began over 100 years ago, it was essentially a skill-based dribbling game which was played at somewhere between a walk and a trot. Fast forward to the modern game. The field's the same size, the goals are the same size as 130 years ago, but the players are way bigger, way faster and cover way more ground. In other words, it's a lot harder to score in open play than it once was, and that's where the free kick comes in. Plenty has changed about football from a physical point of view. For starters, the height of the average midfielder has grown something like 10 centimetres in the last 100 years. They're now an average of 181 centimetres tall and 80 kilograms. This is a body scan of Adelaide United's Travis Dodd. Gone are the days of the thin-limbed, gangling footballer or the rotund figure of someone like Hungary's Pushkash. It's a lot different than in the old days. The first and most important thing is we tailor the programs to the individual needs of the players. They're all different heights, they're different ages, and they have different uh, training regimes because of the different positions they play. Well, years of scientific research have shown us that dehydration impairs performance. So if you don't get enough fluid in during the game, then uh, performance suffers. It suffers from a cardiovascular point of view, from a concentration point of view, from a heat tolerance point of view, and all of those things are important. Back in the 60s, players could sprint at around 7 metres per second maximum speed. Now they can cover 9.5 metres per second. That not only makes the game faster and gives players less time to make decisions, it also increases the amount of energy that goes into a clash of bodies by something like 50% when compared to 40 years ago. There's an element of psychology to all of this. What we are trying to do is mess with the goalie's mind. Look into my eyes. <laughs> and there's evidence around to suggest that the human mind doesn't cope all that well with a curving ball. Apparently, it all goes back to when we were cavemen throwing rocks. We got pretty good at dodging them in those days because they don't tend to move through the air all that much, and we've still got that hang up today. I mean, let's face it, who wants to come for a cross in the middle of a rock fight? Yes. This is where we can get into some mind games with the goalie. Some people reckon they're not too bright. I don't want to go there. The main thing is they can be really hard to second guess. You tend to try and keep your eyes focused on the ball at all times um, because they can do a shimmy with their hips or give you a bit of a dummy with their foot. You can see which way their foot goes. So basically I just try and look at the ball. Science now tells us that our brains sometimes do things that actually happen too fast for us to think about. Confused? Well, don't be. It's called pre-thinking. OK, when you're looking at something and reacts, you have two parts. One that goes to the higher centres, you know, your cortex, and one that bypasses all that. It happens in the most primitive centres that we have. We share this with uh, cheetahs, lions, antelopes. We react faster that way than thinking. That's why we think of it as a pre-thinking. We all have it, but the goalkeepers have it better than we do. We can also be a bit more scientific about where we put the ball. For example, Daniel Beltrame of Adelaide United is pretty big. His wingspan is well over two metres, but there are areas of weakness for every goalie. Put it low either side of him and the body struggles to get down to the ball because our hips get in the way when we try to bend sideways. Put it in the top corner and he'll struggle too. It's very hard to reach up and dive at the same time. However, put the ball anywhere in the goals between knee and shoulder height and you'll have the problem. There have been huge advances in the technology of football, particularly the ball itself. For example, this is a modern version of the ball I used to play with. 32 panel, leather, hand stitched. Straight as a gun barrel, virtually impossible to bend. Allow me to demonstrate. Anyway, I think I've made my point. So, as goalkeepers got bigger and defences got better, ball technology finally caught up in 1994 with the advent of the more aerodynamic modern ball. 
This is the ball for this year's World Cup. Adidas says its revolutionary panel design means the ball is perfectly round. It has seamless thermal bonding between the panels and it now has improved accuracy and power. Fair enough, but how does a ball that's hit hard and straight suddenly dip and swerve? Well, science has come up with the answer. Well, we now know that there are two types of airflow around the ball. You kick it hard and fast, the airflow is turbulent, but as it slows down, say around 40 kilometres an hour, it's going to change into a laminar airflow. Now, turbulent airflow is really good at hugging the surface of the ball, creates a small wake and small drag. But laminar flow, it separates early from the ball, leaves a huge wake and huge drag. And that's going to have a tremendous impact on the way in which this ball flies through the air. When it switches from turbulent to laminar, there's going to be a huge drag in the ball, it's going to slow and it's going to dip underneath the crossbar. There have also been huge leaps in the way clubs can use technology to train their players. To curl the ball, you either need to hit the ball off centre, which will produce a good spin, but it will be quite inaccurate. The other way to do it would be to change your run-up so that you use a very curved action in your leg, which will produce the spin, but be more accurate. And we can use our high-spec technology to help the athletes understand how to actually get that effect. OK, we've looked at the history, the physiology, the psychology and the technology, but I can't help feeling there's still something missing. Go back to the old days, um, guys could bend balls um, with boots that were like rubber boots and with balls that were like kicking concrete blocks, um, but they still did it. Technology had no part in that whatsoever. That was natural ability. Um, but like I said, I think if you've got talent, that's great, uh, but there is no substitute for hard work. Right, I practiced this for years when I was a kid and it never really did much good. Let's see if science can make a difference in my attempt to find the perfect free kick. Just step back, fellas, give me a little room here. Science Outside the Square will link people and projects from all over South Australia to question the science of today and help shape a better tomorrow. So visit the website, register for an event and prepare to be involved, amazed and inspired.